I have to address a recent issue raised by Stefan Molyneux of FreedomainRadio.com. Dear friend, you have said yourself that it is the greatest favor that one could give you to prove you wrong. And with your recent comments on martial arts, I am happy to be enjoying this wonderful, most incredible opportunity to do you the greatest favor possible. Because you said that people who are attracted to martial arts are attracted to it because they have a violent history. And it makes perfect sense. And I understand not only why you would say something like that, but why it would piss off so many martial arts enthusiasts in your audience and who happened to wander by your YouTube channel when they saw the first video that you did about this from a Sunday call-in show. And I actually, I watched all of these videos. I watched all the videos that you did about this. And it was really, it was finally, finally, in the very last video you did about it, 26 minutes in that you finally admit that maybe it's possible to enjoy martial arts without some warped psychological motivation. But I just want to say, here's the favor that I'm going to do for you, because it wasn't that your statement was in and of itself factually incorrect. It was incorrect primarily in the presumptiveness of you collectivizing people who are attracted to martial arts. You made an error of calculation on that count as well as on presumption. And you made the presumption that there's nobody who is attracted to martial arts for emotionally, or for not for emotionally unhealthy reasons, as you suggest, because, because they have a violent past. And, and you're correct in this theory, but if you simply said there are some people who are attracted to martial arts, a minority perhaps, even a large segment of those who are attracted to martial arts, who are attracted to it because of emotionally unhealthy reasons, because of insecurities, because, as you said, they had a violent past that they are attempting to recreate and then somehow control and irrationally seek that control. And you know, you said that the one thing that, uh, you know, it, it, the one argument that commenters could have given you that would have refuted your argument would, is, would be if they said, well, I, have, I didn't have a violent childhood. And, yeah, I know, you said, okay, well, as soon as I mentioned it, everybody else started, you know, I swear to God, to turn a phrase, that I actually thought of it before you raised that. Because I'm into MMA. I, I'm, uh, I'm on a brief hiatus for work at the moment. But I regularly train at uh, Team Lloyd Irvin here in Arlington, Virginia, and in uh, Judo, Jiu Jitsu, and Muay Thai. And I love it, and it's great. And for me, it's a continuation of a, 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 long, a, a whole life that I've spent enjoying challenging sports. And you know, you, you actually mentioned uh, you, you know, your experience with dance, and we're trying to compare that. But you know, b before. Before I, before I get into some of the, the, the specific counterpoints I'd like to raise, I, I want to say something about the nature of, of the conversation that you've been having with your audience and with the, the gentlemen that were interviewing you in your last video that was really disturbing because you, you are someone that, that I can normally count on in turning to to have a, a, a thorough analytical process and to be consistent in your logic, and yet you were talking past each other because you got a poor reaction from your audience when you first posited this theory. And you know people gave you reasons for why people could be attracted to mixed martial arts in particular as opposed to other sports. Because that's, that's, the, that's the point here. You're, you're saying sports are good, sports are healthy, physical activity is essential, but mixed martial arts you know, that's, that's, you can only be doing that if you're crazy, if you have emotional problems, or if you have whatever it is, uh, the, the much more eloquent way that you stated it. But people gave you reasons, and the, one of the problems is that the, the knee-jerk reaction, the, the easiest response is to, to, to counter that, well, it's, it's self-defense. And you're right to say that it's a red herring, but even then, I have, to, like, I have to weigh in on this, because there is a, the way that you are talking about this, the way that you've been covering this in your videos, misses... The, the, the truth about the validity of the argument that studying martial arts is beneficial for self-defense, because you say that's ridiculous, and you make the point, you know, saying it's like, 
you know, learning how to fly every airplane in case you get in that one situation where the pilot and the co-pilot have heart attacks and you have to land the plane. Sure, there is a legitimate self-defense benefit to mixed martial arts, but it's very minuscule and it's not efficient. It's a side benefit. If you're in an unusual situation where you have to physically defend yourself and you're unarmed and you're in a dangerous situation and you don't know, there's no way to get away from your attacker, yes, there's a marginal self-defense benefit from learning martial arts. And you're absolutely correct in saying, you're, if that was your primary concern, your time would be much better spent in taking a self-defense course, in carrying a, a gun if necessary, or pepper spray. I'm a big advocate of pepper spray. I carry pepper spray pretty much everywhere I go, especially places where I'm not able to take a firearm. But I would never carry a firearm without also carrying pepper spray. I don't think that's responsible because of all the legitimate reasons for people to carry firearms. Uh, with so many situations being better resolved by pepper spray. So in that sense, I, I think that you, you started you know, talking past each other, but I, I, wanna, I wanna get to the heart of the matter because people threw out a lot of reasons at you why they might psychologically enjoy martial arts as opposed to other sports, and there were things about self-discipline that you mentioned, and I don't know, I didn't read all of the comments on your video, but I'd like to give my shot, at least, at, at explaining to you why there is a unique attraction to martial arts that's not just the hitting, but for which the hitting is an essential part of it. And now you compared your experience in dance to, to martial arts. And you know what, I, I, I think it's an interesting comparison because I, I did dance too. I'm, I don't know if you noticed, I'm a bit of a dance enthusiast, <laughs> even if, if, you, uh, if you can catch me around the memorials in DC. But I actually, in college, did a semester on the ballroom dance team. And now it's not a major feat. It was uh, you know, about one in five of the women that, got, uh, uh, that, that auditioned got selected, and you know, a little better than one in two of, of the men. But I did a semester, and I really enjoyed it. And it was a great challenge, but it was, um, it was more of a way to meet girls than to really challenge myself physically. Uh, a little bit psychologically in, in, in the distinct challenge of memorizing choreography and, and specific motor control of the body, certainly. But at the same time, when I was taking dance in college, I was also on the rugby team, something I did for a little longer, that I kind of equate a little bit more to MMA. Now you yourself say that you are waiting and looking forward to the day when you get to play tennis with your daughter, when she's old enough to step up. Now wh why is that? Why is it that you would rather play tennis with your daughter than simply enjoy dancing with her now? Could it be, could it be, Stefan, that there is a unique experience of pitting your body, your physical abilities against another human beings in contest, in competition, that you get in tennis that you don't quite get in dance, even competitive dance. Could it be that that is a little more heightened in a sport like, say, rugby, where even though the objective is not the destruction of another human body, which isn't the objective in martial arts anyways, but the delivering of a ball across a line in a way that allows you to be physically pitted against your opponents such that you are forced body to body into a struggle where the outcome is determined on, on your physical abilities, not on some judge's rating or somebody else's opinion, but on the immediate unforgiving physical reality that is contact sports. And in that sense, Martial arts, you're right, it's not for self-defense. And to fight the myth of that is certainly noble. But there is something absolutely unique and psychologically gratifying and truly makes, in, in a way that truly makes me feel alive. Of it, and, and really in a relatively controlled environment of martial arts. Because, yeah, you, can, you, you pointed out that regular injuries are, are common in martial arts. Sure, same thing in rugby. In fact, like you pointed out, it's almost a guarantee that you will, you will be injured if you, if you play rugby for a, year, for a season. Same thing if you're in, you know, if you're in MMA or martial arts and you're actually competitive, you're gonna get injured, sure. But what are the odds of dying? Now, let me just point that out to, to, to point out how safe and controlled 
martial arts are, if you accept minor or moderate injury as part of the challenge, as I do, as I, like, I don't, when, when I got injured playing rugby, I didn't think of it as, oh, my life quality is deteriorating. No, it's part of the challenge. It's like, like, like you know, having someone score a try against you. You know, I, I had my nose broken three times playing rugby, and I didn't think of it as, uh, you know, and I had, I had a serious knee injury that was a threat to, to my long-term health. I had, I've had serious shoulder injuries that I've been able to recover from. In that sense, I'm, I've, I've been pretty lucky with how many injuries I've, I've, and serious injuries I've, I've been able to recover from. But let me, let me propose something slightly different that maybe you should turn your efforts towards in, in a slightly more critical way, but in a way that, again, you might be tempted to make the error of presumption. And that is with motorcycles. I used to ride motorcycles. And when I got back from Iraq, I used, I used to white line between the lanes of traffic. And for me, more fun than going 180 miles an hour, which I did several times on the 5 freeway and ruined a bike by blowing out the head gasket. It was a Kawasaki 929, really souped up. Um, for me, it was more fun to be going 80 miles an hour through traffic that was going 25. And that was fucking stupid. Like, yeah. I, and, and what I mean by that is, is the risk to reward ratio. And it would be presumptuous of me to tell someone else doing that right now, hey man, um, you know, that's really stupid. But what if they really enjoy it? People take risks for their enjoyment, for their personal gratification all the time, such as life. And in that sense, uh, you know, you might be quick to point out and, and appropriate to point out, hey, you know, are, are, you, are you engaging in said thrill-seeking behavior because maybe you just got back from Iraq and you're trying to recreate that unhealthy stimulation of combat, that adrenaline dump? Sure, 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 that, you know, and, and, and giving people an opportunity to do that. But, but Stefan, please don't insult the intelligence of people who engage in mixed martial arts by saying that, oh, you, you're, this is so stupid, this activity is so stupid that the only way you could be doing this is if you're crazy, if you're getting some other psychological gratification of it because you had a violent past. Because let me tell you, there is something as well about a, a natural primal anxiety that, that may be very realistic, that may be uh, being managed in a, in a healthy, appropriate way through martial arts, that people are able to get out a natural, healthy, built-in aggression in a healthy way. And, and you can say, okay, maybe maybe they should psychologically deal with it. And then in that sense, it's simply an inefficient, cheap form of therapy. But in that sense, even for people that do have a violent past, their engagement in martial arts for all of the challenge that they get out of it, all of the excitement that they get out of it, all of the self-discipline, and then control over that violence and self-discipline that they gain out of it might actually be more effective than therapy for them as individuals dealing with that. I would hope, Stefan, of all people, that you would respect that individuality and hope that no one is going to accuse you for not being gutsy enough for looking forward to the day when you can get in a boxing match with your daughter. But I would also hope that, uh, that this is a, an opportunity for you to appreciate not just the, the knee-jerk reactions of those who are involved in martial arts because of their violent pasts, because of, of emotionally unhealthy reasons. And see that there, there are legitimate things to appreciate about participating in martial arts. There is something unique to that challenge that people like me very, very much enjoy that makes us feel all the more alive and is truly invigorating to have your body challenged face to face against another human being whose mission is to subdue you and vice versa, that you are locked in that mock combat. It is not a real combat, as you know, it is a, as you pointed out, there's no moral problem with mixed martial arts. But let me say, you might perhaps want to direct your efforts at, instead of psychoanalyzing the martial arts enthusiasts of your audience collectively, perhaps looking at other sports that have much clear, obvious psychological deficiencies associated with them, like the tribalism that you see around football or the nationalism that you see around soccer or other international sports. But I hope, I hope that, uh, that, that from, from hearing this, I have at least given you the favor of pointing out as I, as, I, as I may humbly attempt to do so, what I think was a simple fallacy, not in your analysis in the background, 
but in the final conclusion, in delivering it in a way that was both presumptuous and collectivizing, and also delivered in a way that was an insult to the intelligence of everybody who heard your message, who is a fan of martial arts. And for any fans of Stefan Molyneux who were a little pissed off and decided to unsubscribe, we'll take you here at Adam vs. The Man. But if anything, you should be subscribed to both of our channels. But if it really is an MMA perspective on liberty you're looking for, I'm excited to announce that my own brother is going to be coming on as a writer contributor to Adam vs. The Man when we launch our nightly newscast starting in a couple of weeks. And as a separate segment as well, we are going to have a weekly review of the week in MMA. Oh my gosh, it's a revolution. That was just the start. We've got some hashes, so most of these are going to be a bubble extraction hash, y'all. Please lend me your wisdom. I have watched in awe as you have grown from stubble to what you have become.